Well, um, it is almost 5 of 10. We wanted to start at 10 of 10, but anyways, um, good morning everyone. It's um, Tuesday, January 17th, the second half of the month. That's good. great. Um, and um, so we have uh, uh, Alan Keeler with us and uh, Jake uh, Carlo. Claro. Pardon? Claro, yeah. Claro. Yeah. And um, so we're going to talk uh, again about our food systems and how, uh, how and what we might be able to do uh, to improve that for our citizens. Um, so, um, and we've got until noon, so we got a long, long, uh, straight through time. Uh, we'll take a, a little break, maybe if we need one around 11. Uh, but um, we'd like to uh, have the committee introduce themselves, and then you folks can get those two chairs at the head of the table. And uh, but we'll have a. A presentation, a good discussion. So, uh, Brian. Yep, I'm Senator Collimore from the Rutland District. Good morning, good to see you guys. Good to see you guys again. Hi, Irene Renner, the North. North Brian. Brian Campion, Bennington County. Rich West, Lynn and Wyoming. And I'm Bobby Starr from Orleans County. So welcome, and uh, and maybe uh, uh, we have three new members here to the Ag Committee. Yep. Uh, so when you introduce yourselves, you probably give a little uh, spiel on how long you've been doing what you're doing and how bad you've been doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's great to, to have you both with us. It, uh, we've done this for quite a while. And, yeah. and uh, there's a few things I think we doing good, so yeah, absolutely. so uh, welcome. And uh, I don't know which yeah. one of you wants to start. Oh, out. Sorry, no. yeah. uh, sure. Great. Uh, so let's go for it. Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. We always look forward to this conversation, and especially because there are uh, three of you who are new to this committee, and uh, Senator, you're you're new to the, the whole. Kid and caboodle here at the state house, right? I so, am. and I should mention that I'm also in Fairfax with one town. So, Fairfax. so uh, okay. Very rural. Yes, I know that. Yep, great. So, what we thought we would do for you today, um, um, typically what we've always done in the past, and this is part of the statute of the Farm to Plate Investment Program that we administer, is we normally come in and provide a, a, an annual report of the last year's activities. And we will be doing that with you next week in joint, jointly with House Ag. We often have traditionally done it as a joint um, meeting. So we'll be doing that next week to really focus in on the, the, the fiscal 22 activities. However, because so many of you are new, because this is a new biennium, we thought that it would be good to provide some history and some grounding in the state strategic plan for developing our food system so that you can then um, have some more familiarity with it and be able to use it throughout the session um, as you're getting other people coming in to give you testimony, give you a good strong grounding of what's going on uh, out there on the land um, in our food manufacturing, in our distribution, um, the whole entire uh, food system. And happy to have this be as much of a discussion and, and asking of questions as is yeah. useful for you all because this is really this is really for you for you all is your time to learn some more about uh, the food system in Vermont so that you can uh, do your work uh, as effectively as possible. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit of the history and sort of what transpired over the first ten years of the Farm to Plate Investment Program through this retrospective. And then Jake's going to um, walk you through the uh, strategic plan for the current 10-year cycle that we're in and walk you through how to use this document as a, as a resource and a tool for, for your policy work. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Sounds good. Uh, right. one quick question. So is this is it part of the agency of ag? No. No. Okay, that was the one yeah, thing. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll start okay. there. Thank you. So the Sustainable Jobs Fund, I'm the executive director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Jake is the Farm to Plate director. 
uh, which is a program within uh, the Jobs Fund. Um, I've been there since 2005. The Sustainable Jobs Fund was actually created by an act of the legislature in 1995. You were here, Senator, for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was intended to be outside of state government, so we are a 501c3 um, um, organization, uh, independent organization. Our statute, if you were to take a look at it online, will show you that the Secretary of Commerce or designee, the Secretary of Ag or designee, and one seat is, is appointed by the governor. And then we have eight independent members. So we're this interesting sort of quasi-governmental entity. And, uh, but very much a nonprofit with a 501c3 nonprofit status. Um, so we work very closely with various agencies, the Agency of Commerce, Agency of Ag, Natural Resources, Health Department, FPNR. We, we have very strong relationships and good, good communication, good working relationship. Um, so, and we can do things often from a process standpoint that inside state government they, have, they may be more challenged to do because of the rules by which they are governed. Um, so having this sort of inside outside kind of uh, connection it has proved to be actually very useful, right? There's lots of stuff at the Agency of Ag that really they are best suited to do and that we're like so excited that they're doing it and they're doing it well and then there's stuff that really is, is better suited for an organization like us to do. So that's how we sort of divide and conquer. So, yeah. um, so uh, when in 2009 the legislature asked, created the Farm to Plate Investment Program it was an interesting first time ever really uh, initiative, as you'll recall, yeah. where House Ag and Commerce Committee and the Senate Ag and Senate Economic Development Community, Committee worked collaboratively to create and launch that program with the, because the notion was agricultural development is the same as economic development. It is a form of economic development, especially yeah. for our rural communities. And prior to Farm to Plate, that was not understood, especially by the economic development community. You take a look at, just as a point of reference, the, uh, the website of thinkvermont.com back in 2008, 2009, there was like no real reference to agriculture, to breweries, to the working landscape, any of that. Now, it is front and center on their website, right? It is like, come to Vermont, experience our working landscape, experience our breweries, and drink our milk, and have our maple syrup, and take it back with you, right? <laughs> totally stay different. At our tiny farm exactly. house. And exactly. Mm -hmm. it, wouldn't you say, Senator, it's like, it is really quite a, a, a radical difference. Oh, definitely. Right? Yeah. Right? So that is in part, I, I would like to say, it, I, I think, it's because of the way we have come together as a community of, of organizations from nonprofits to business to the state government entities to capital providers to educators to really work together towards the greater uh, effort that's uh, in the statute of the outcomes for this program. And the outcomes are around increasing economic activity and jobs within the farm and food sector to um, uh, work on improving water, soil, uh, overall land use in, in, a, in a sound environmental way, and then um, providing healthy local food for all Vermonters. So there's the, the, the really those three components of the eco economics, the environment, and the social uh, justice and, and equity piece is baked into this statute. It is what governs us, it is what guides us, and, and it is absolutely the thread that links that, that is embedded in the state, in this plan that was created. Yeah. So we take it very seriously. We track metrics on it um, over, every year. Um, and so that's part of what we do when we come in to, you, to meet with you is we share where are we at? What are the trend lines saying? What's happening? So, um, so it, it was set up as a 10-year initiative in 2009. We published the first plan in January of 2011 when, Senator, uh, when Governor Shumlin uh, arrived. Um, the legislature tasked the Jobs Fund with serving in this planning, implementation, monitoring role rather than the agency uh, of agriculture, which was also very quite unique at the time. I think it was um, actually a very useful way of doing a project like this or a program like this because it was basically saying we want to see a 10-year plan. We know that there's going to be changes in administration. So we need to have, we don't want to have a plan that's 
you know, like for one administration and then a completely different plan for another administration. And, and so, and, and as it is, we've, got, we've been working with three different governors right over this yeah. last period right and and that stability yeah. i think has been a really powerful part is given people sense like oh we're all in this together it doesn't matter what the party is doesn't matter what's going on uh with who's the secretary like this is our collective plan right yeah. so and it was over a 10-year horizon so in 2019 we approached senator Starr and then chair partridge and said do you want us to keep going with this <laughs> do you want another 10 years or not and we asked all of our partners in the field, the same thing. And uh, you all felt like, yeah, no, we can't stop now. So in 2019, you all reauthorized Farm to Plate yeah. uh, to do a, a second 10-year plan and to go, go at it through 2030. And I think that it's also that, that, that um, from a policy perspective, I think is really smart when you set something up as a legislative body for a 10-year time horizon to then use that 10-year mark to like evaluate, how are we doing? Is this worth continuing? And then making a very intentional decision, okay, yes, or okay, no. And in this case, you all said yes. And so we set about um, in 2020 and 2021, and we worked very closely with the Agency of Agriculture to craft this document, <clears throat> which is, is now considered the state's food system development plan. Um, it has informed the Governor's Commission on the Future of Agriculture. They use this as a, a foundational document. I serve on that commission, and I spend a lot of time briefing the commi other commissioners about what's in here. They use it very, like, it's, it's the base, it's the foundation. Jake served on the Agriculture and uh, Ecosystem uh, Committee for mm -hmm. the Vermont Climate Action Council and planning process. He brought this to that process, and so there's a lot of the recommendations stem from what's in this document. The Agency of Agriculture and their strategic plan references all of this on a regular basis. So, like, so we've worked really hard to, in essence, be in alignment with one another. So that we're all, we all have our different means, right? And different focus, but we're all going in the same direction. We're all pulling the wagon up. Exactly. Together. Exactly. Not some going backwards and some <laughs> yeah. sideways. And, exactly. Uh, and, and, and it works. So. It's really powerful. So Farm to School is embedded in this, right? The, the Universal Meals is embedded in this. It's one of the core strategies. So the work that the food bank is doing, like all the food security stuff is in here, Good. right? So this is the foundation um, that, you know, you could very easily ask anybody that comes in to present to you, um, how does it relate to the strategic plan? And they should be able to tell you. The uh, <clears throat> last week we had uh, some folks in uh, talking about uh, our own food, how much but they, they claim that we're still short of food here in Vermont that what, two and five or yep. uh, a number like that are food uh, insecure. deficient mm -hmm. and insecure. Yep. <clears throat> and golly, we've, we've been at this quite a while to still have some uh, in trouble. And uh, we didn't question those numbers, but uh, uh, I, I know we certainly have a lot more people producing food than we used to have, and it's helped our rural economy and rural areas of Vermont uh, very much. So, yep. um, yeah, and I think that speaks to the fact that the food system is not something that's in isolation to every other system. So our overall economic system has created incredible wealth inequalities, and has and we haven't. We haven't got the childcare system we need and the housing and the workforce and all of these things interact, they all intersect. And it's one of the things that we plan to spend a lot more time on these next 10 years is where there's overlap between these systems because we can't solve food, food insecurity in isolation no. for a whole bunch of other, other systems. Yeah. No. So just to give you a quick recap of the first, uh, so on page uh, seven of this document, um, just as a grounding, this is what we mean when we talk about a food system. It incorporates inputs, production, processing, wholesale, retail, 
the consumer aspect of it in terms of consumer demand, what are they, what, are, what are ag literacy, what are people wanting to, to, to eat, and then nutrient management. And then the outer ring, and the, so the inner ring is really the private sector. It's really what we're trying to do is to focus policy programs, funding, um, alignment, uh, strengthening the overall connectivity between businesses because the businesses are the ones that create the food for us, right? And then it's the outer ring of policymakers like yourselves, government agencies, nonprofits like us, food hubs, um, the, the educational system that is the support system for our food system, right? And so we're trying to strengthen all of those components because they all interact and are all important to each other. So if you um, uh, pop to page uh, 10, there's a diagram there that just, uh, and I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but over the, once we released the plan in January of 2011, we then formed a network of organizations because the, any, the definition of a system is that it's complex and that no one organization can fix it, mm -hmm. and, you know, can really truly transform it or change it. It takes a collaborative, multi-organizational approach. And so we built this network around the key areas of the food system that we learned through the stakeholder engagement process we did from the first plan about where there was real challenges. So we learned about aggregation and distribution needs where small producers had trouble getting into markets, especially out of state. And we want to talk more about that yeah. to, to see if, you know, if that needs improving, uh, if there's something that we can do it yep. in the legislature to, yep. to expand that so that we aren't missing growers and they have an adequate place to yep. take their supplies. Yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll get with that with, uh, when we when, jump over to Jake because that's definitely an area that we see needs, needs uh, some attention. Um, we did a lot on education and workforce development, uh, for instance. We published a career guide for jobs in the food system a few years ago. Um, we've done a lot in looking at, at farmland access. We've looked a lot at um, strengthening the business and technical assistance service provision to farms and food businesses. Um, there's been a lot of, of, of real tangible projects, a lot of uh, key documents really that have been developed. And, and in part, what we see as our role is to help with what we call sense making. You know, everything is, because things are so complex, it can often be challenging to really understand, well, what's really going on? What's the stuff that's underneath what might be visible to us and sort of in a crisis mode? Mm -hmm. And what's really underneath that? And so a lot of what, like for instance, in the early days, um, there are two quick examples. Uh, we, a lot of producers were wanting to sell to Sodexo into UVM and to the Sodexo accounts in the institutions. But there were some key structural things related to contracting practices that Sodexo had that none of us understood. And if you couldn't crack the, the vendor contracting process, how to become a qualified vendor, you were never going to sell into Sodexo. So we, we did a whole forum. We brought Sodexo leadership together with producers and service providers. And they, they put it out on the table. This is, they said, this is how you become a certified vendor with us. And producers were like, great, okay. I, you know, Some of them said, I'm not interested. Others were like, no, I wanna do that. The point is, it was something that was not visible, right? And we helped create a, 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 a way to make what was invisible visible. And then producers could decide whether or not they wanted to take advantage of that, right? The same thing was happening, yeah. as Senator Starr will know well, during, um, 2010, 2011, 13, even up to 2014, there was a real lack of slaughterhouse capacity in the state and small producers were really struggling. And so we pulled together people, uh, businesses across the entire supply chain. The first time really this has happened with small producers, processors, uh, chefs, distributors, um, uh, service providers, Vita was at the table, like the entire supply chain, people that work in grocery stores at meat counters that were looking for qualified uh, meat cutters, everybody together to really unpack and understand what's really going on here. Do we, because as Senator Starr might remember, the, the, the initial thought was, well, let's just build more slaughterhouse capacity, right? And what we yeah. found was that that I wasn't really cutters. the issue. We didn't have meat cutters and processing and storage 
for the animals that were like they, there was plenty of time when the kill floor space was not being used but it was the processing that was the bottleneck so had we not dug into that and really looked at what was really going on we would have potentially spent a lot of money to build yeah. slaughterhouses that we didn't actually need at that time. Had no people to run them. <laughs> right, and no people to run them. So what that did though, that process, Mark Curran, who was then owner of, of Black River Produce, was at those meetings and had sort of an inkling in his mind about meat. He got really interested in this and then bought the old Ben and Jerry's facility down in North Springfield and turned it into what then became Black River Meats and Vermont Packing House with as a joint project with uh, Lorenzo Meats out in, in Wisconsin, Minnesota? It's Minnesota. Minnesota. And so now he sold that, but that added capacity came on at a time that then for a period of time really so actually solved the problem. It actually was a major piece of capacity at scale that really supported things. We then heard a few years later from the processors, we don't have enough animals. We've got more processing capacity now. We need more animals, right? This is how supply and demand works. So now we're back, the pendulum is swung again, and we don't have enough capacity, and we have more animals. We have more market opportunity. The pandemic really showed this, right? So now we're at a place again where and, and there's been a lot more federal awareness about this, federal dollars being put forward, the USDA, and uh, Secretary Tebbets has been a real, his team has been a real leader on this, of really helping to get more funding to go into expanding existing processing. Uh, there was just a really large, was it a million dollar SIG grant or $1.2 million grant that the Agency of Commerce oh, awarded to Vermont uh, to uh, Slaughter Fair and Meat Processing in Ferrisburg. Yeah, well, Ferrisburg. Yeah. 1.3 million dollars yeah. to expand that, that they facility. They said that's going to be about a four million dollar yeah. total cost project yeah. when right. it gets done. Yeah. yeah. They can run, they'll be able to run some animals through there. Yeah, exactly. And a part of the state that desperately needs that extra capacity, right? Yeah. So that that that's the we have a convening power at this organization where we can bring people together who have vested interests uh, in the system working. But they can't do it alone, right? They need to be connected to people on the other side of where they are in the supply chain mm -hmm. to understand how the system works better so that they can then better adjust their business to meet the market opportunity. Because the market opportunity is absolutely there, right? So if you flip to page 19, I'll just uh, sort of, uh, on the bottom corner there, sort of the big, the big aha takeaway highlights are that uh, Vermont's food system, all in, direct, indirect, induced, sort of the size of the food system is uh, $11.9 billion as of 2017. So by now, it's probably well over $12 billion. Um, and 2.9, probably now well over 3 billion, are, is just food manufacturing. So again, we're talking big numbers. This is the, in totality, I mean, dairy is the biggest within the food system. But the food system compared to say tourism or other types of manufacturing or other types of services, healthcare, this is a big deal, right? And it's where our rural economies connect the most. So it is, it is important, it is so vital, you know, from a working landscape, a heritage, a history, as well as the yeah. economics. Uh, people, people don't understand yeah. how important our total agricultural uh, money is ar around the state yeah. and um, yeah they think of it as well it's a few dollars here and a few dollars there but yeah. boy when you add it all up yeah uh, yeah it used to be um, and not that many years ago uh, our milk production is down a little bit but not not a lot but it used to be like 85% of the milk went south to southern New England and, and New York. And, and now, you know, 65 to 70% of our milk stays home and it's being manufactured here. So it's given, you know, hundreds of people jobs and good jobs. Uh, like at Ben and Jerry's or over at Cabot or down the yogurt plant and a lot of small uh, uh, processors, you know, they process their own and, and Jasper Hill's got a, a 
big crew that works there, yep. and uh, it it's good that our economy is growing, but it's all inclusive right here at home. Yeah, right. And uh, so it's giving a a lot of people work and certainly helped a lot of our rural communities. Yep. Um, exactly. Just the farmers markets are incredible to me. Yep. From yep. twenty years ago, I remember. Like Craftsbury had just a few little things, and now yeah, they're, they're just oh, totally everywhere. Yeah, people the pack them, and yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, and and you know, there's over sixty five thousand people that are employed in the food system. How many? Sixty five thousand. Yeah. If you, I mean, a um, lot of it is, is in that. restaurant. You know, a lot of it is in restaurant and food yeah. service. Yeah. But it's still like it's still connected to food. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you can produce all you want, but if you don't have a means of selling it and people to help sell it, like. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, we're not going to do it all. Uh, unfortunately, the, as great as as farmers markets and CSAs are, yeah. they still only represent about three percent of total farm gate sales in the wow. state. Right, yeah. very important yeah, from a right. from an interface, learning what the customer wants, ag literacy, those kinds of things. But it's never going to be the big mover of large quantities of food as a market outlet. Right, yeah. it has other functions. Right. So the other thing to know is that we, uh, back in, in 2010, when we were in the process of developing the first plan, we wanted to know, well, how much local production was being consumed by Vermonters? And there was no way to actually know that, so we created a methodology with, um, at the time, UVM uh, professor uh, David Connor and a couple of his, a grad student of his, and back then, uh, actually, Auditor Hoffer was actually involved in the conversation because he's, you know, a big data guy. And anyways, we created a, a, a methodology that actually has been since has been um, peer reviewed and is now like accepted as sort of a good process for trying to count up local food consumption. At the time, we could count reliably only two and a half percent. We we estimated that we were probably consuming about five percent which is like a pretty small number still. And that was about $114 million that we could count, right? That we had a sense about. In 20, and then we did the same count process every three years. And in 2020, we had gotten up to 16% and 371 million. So 10 year period, about $257 million more that of, of, of Vermont uh, produced and consumed here Sales and that includes Vermont restaurants, you know, people that eat away from home, as well as uh, buying to food for eating at home. So huge impact. But again, because we were tasked by all of you to report back, we took that very seriously, and we built in the processes to be collecting the metrics to be able to uh, keep track of these trends, right? And that's been a really yeah. powerful way then. Uh, you know, the, the economic development community, for instance, the regional development corporations, the Department of Economic Development, as I said, they didn't really understand what they what, what was going on um, in, in 2009, 2011. When we started publishing the data that showed that, that $3 billion of food manufacturing was happening, they could understand food manufacturing because it's manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So they got very excited and now like they're like, oh, well, how can we help you know, we've got businesses in our regions. How do we help them when they need to grow into a bigger facility? How do I help them find the places? The uh, in your region, NVDA has yeah. been instrumental. Instrumental. A lot of <clears throat> finding locations, helping with federal funding streams. Yeah. Well, and that yellow yellow, yellow, yellow barn. barn project right. in Hardwick, which is. Yeah, you know, it's close to home. We're all, we're all in it together exactly. out there. And, exactly. Uh, that's going to be exciting and yeah. and will totally. help too as we move forward. Yeah. But that, that, none of that existed back in 27, 2008, 2009. You know, it no. just it wasn't. So on pages 21 through. Uh, page 26, but. Definitely 24, 34, sorry, 21 to 34. What we tried to do in this document was to provide some results of a t over a 10 year time horizon. So I won't go over this, but just for your light reading, you know, at night when you have nothing else to do, um, you know, you can take a look at these and very quickly get some snapshots of the trend lines for things like land and agriculture and 
um, stream miles impaired uh, and how that's been turning around and net uh, losses and gains for farms and dairy sales and increased uh, meat processing infrastructure and um, beverage and manufacturing sales, like all those institutional sales. Um, you know, on page 39, we made huge uh, changes and improvements in the institutional sales. Um, and then of course COVID happened and uh, K through 12 sales uh, went up because we were investing heavily in making sure that kids had food during the pandemic. But take a look at the drop in higher ed, you know, hospitals went up in local food at page, where I'm at page 29. Um, but you know, hospitals went up and, uh, but institutional sales, colleges really dropped because schools were closed. Yeah. You know, mm. but, but, but that's the thing is like, we can, tr we tracking these trends so that we can see what might be going on uh, and where there might be, oh, oh, we better, we better, you know, get in on this a little bit more and, and see what, if there's a bottleneck that needs to be fixed. Has this recovered by the way? It has, uh, we, for this it has, but we don't know what it is because okay. we haven't done a count, but we expect okay. that the next, yeah, 2023 will be on this yeah. count. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah and I, I think higher ed will probably be slightly below what was the peak in 2017. And that's, uh, you know, I think enrollment numbers and also just, uh, yeah, on campus living situations are different. Um, yeah, so it's, it might be slightly lower than it was previously. Bobby, may I say something about higher ed? It's interesting, you know, I, I've also been in college sure. and parents are so much different. Well, kids are different today, of course, and it really matters what's in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. You know, when they're yeah. coming through for admissions, nope. you know, it wasn't something that I thought about or parents necessarily thought about when they were visiting colleges and universities. But today, especially a college in Vermont, yeah. if they can say, you know, like, so Benning has like a little local products area and they try to get more local, but as much as we can do to kind of help them, like one of the things I say to Benning in college is, you know, I'd love to see Wilcox ice cream there. Yes. I don't know why I'm not seeing Wilcox ice mm -hmm. cream there, but Wilcox ice cream's in Arlington. It's, I think it's the best ice cream. Uh, you know, how can we, I'm not sure what the holdups are there. So anything mm -hmm. you can do to help those institutions. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. appreciate it because uh, it, it helps admissions. It helps everything. Yeah, sure. totally. No, it's okay. No, I, I was just gonna say I think one of the other factors that to, to look at in these and it'll probably show in these numbers as well is uh, labor um, at higher ed. So a lot of inability to hire you know food service staff to to fully staff what they need, and so in yeah. turn that's affecting their purchasing um, decisions. So they're buying. Now more actually processed or pre you know kind of pre-processed. So they don't have to fool with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that in turn has shifted you know what types of local products fit that type of yeah. those types of requirements. And there are products that do, but there's still just some shift of trying to meet that now new demand for that type of like more processed product. You know, That's I mean the true. hospitals, you know, yeah. Sodexo, UVM, for instance, they found that they if they bought like say whole squash, right? And oh. and they processed that, they could get a better price buying a whole couple of cases of squash, having the staff cut it up, they could freeze it, they could turn it into soups, they could turn, do all sorts of stuff with it, right? They could buy it when it was in season where they could get the least, where they could get a good price for it to meet their, their numbers. Um, but that requires, as Jake said, that you have staff on board to do the cutting right. <laughs> and right. the that's dishwashing right and the, all of that stuff. And that's what we have found very directly hearing from Jake serves on the advisory committee for Vermont uh, for Sodexo at UVM. And that's one of the big things that we've learned from them on the inside is like they're like, our numbers aren't going to be as good, but it's not because of lack of trying. Like, we, like they have, you know, they might have we can't 10 find positions, dishwashers. right? We, we've yeah. gone a month with paper. We went a month with paper plates at the college. Wow. So couldn't find anybody to help do dishes. Yeah. I mean, that's how bad the yeah. situation yeah. is out there. So, yeah, that's good not jobs. good. Yeah. Right. yeah. Land fills spill a lot. Right. And, and the nice plates sit in the cupboard. And right, right. Yeah. So um, just last thing that I'll just say, if you turn to page 43, 42, uh, 43. What, before you yeah, leave 29, yeah, what about the institutions? Uh, you know, the state institutions? 
You know, it's really small, and it's been one of those areas that's been really hard to get data because in order for us to get this data, somebody has to collect it, organize it, and, and be willing to give it to us. In the early year, the early counts, we had, uh, we had more ability to get those numbers, and they just, we just haven't gotten them. It's also the case after we had Irene, uh, Tropical Sword Irene, and wow. that cafeteria was a big one when AHS was you know, over in Waterbury. And so just some of the physical locations just are not having cafeterias as much. And so it's, again, it's, it's still a, a sliver. It's an important thing. It's something you guys could absolutely push on some more now that we're, you know, getting on the other side of COVID and things are opening back up. But, um, you know, upstairs, I know the Abbey Group, do, are they still the Abbey Group? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, they, you know, they do a good job. They try to source as much local as possible. Um, yeah. But, like, we, I don't think we, did we ever get data from them? No, I'm trying to think the last time that, yeah. oh yeah, we do, we actually, we do have Abbey Group data. I'm not sure if it includes this yeah, as yeah. part of it, yeah. yeah. So it's not broken, necessarily broken out when we get it, so that's part of the data challenge is just collecting things in the way that uh, we need it. So, so um, but yeah, so I think we can keep pushing on that for sure. Um, so uh, page 42, 43, just, just so that you have a sense of the level of sort of where's the funding coming from all of, for all of this. Um, so over the 10 year period, we've raised uh, close to $5.8 million um, for the Farnham Plate Investment Program. Typically $100,000 comes every year from a general fund appropriation through the Agency of Agriculture to us. And uh, there are times when there might be like a working lands grant for a project that we are project managing. It doesn't ultimately live with us and pay for our staff, but it, it flows through us mm -hmm. to somebody else. Um, so that gets counted that way. And we do use some of our Agency of Commerce funding, which is really operational support, just sort of covers the basics of like the fact that we have an office and that we have phones and we have uh, staff and, and such. Um, but so the state uh, contribution uh, really was a uh, 1.6 million um, of the 5.8 million, and so the rest of it's coming from foundations that we're raising funding for. Those are this is funding that the you know, state government can't access because mm -hmm. it's coming from philanthropic dollars. Um, some federal sources, um, sponsorships from uh, businesses that have supported what we're what we're working on, um, and various miscellaneous other things, the gathering and such, which um, really we're subsidizing the cost mm -hmm. of the gathering. Um, um, but you can just get a general sense of how much goes towards personnel versus special projects over the years. Um, and a lot of it is really, the, the majority of it really is going to the actual working of the network and the, and the projects. Um, uh, Jake, Jake runs a, a lean machine uh, with very little staff and we rely on a lot of consultants uh, to do various pieces. Uh, one of the things he can touch on if you're interested is we, uh, in 2015-16, we started to provide free technical support to independently owned grocery stores, food co-ops, and um, and if, you know, other uh, stores were interested, we, we wouldn't say no, but we were really focusing on the independents and the co-ops about how to develop a stronger local sourcing uh, program in their store as a differentiator with, say, Shaw's or Hannaford's or whatever. And because they're in rural locations, we have we can have relationships with them. They live in the community. They're more res they tend to be more responsive to their customers and what they want. So we uh, Annie Harlow has been on contract uh, for six years now to basically provide a whole range of training, both one on one in the in the store as well as bringing uh, folks together from across the supply chain, distributors. She has developed now a list, uh, a database basically of all the Vermont products. She's constantly adding to it the Vermont products that are produced and which distributors are carrying them and which stores they're in. So, so when she goes and meets with a, a store and says, you know, I really would like to have you know, more variety of this, or I'd like to try this kind of a product. I don't know, I have no idea how to find that. She has a little database now she can look at, and she can, oh, well there's this, this, and this, and these are the distributors that carry them. Oh, and you work with that distributor, why don't you ask them if you can carry that, if you, they could get that product for you. Yeah. Right? So it's that kind of stuff that we can do, getting again to the underneath uh, 
So you might say, well, why can't we get more local food in grocery stores? Well, there's a lot of structural impediments to doing that, a lot of issues. So we're trying now, we're really focusing, spending a lot of time really trying to focus on how do we understand, how do we help producers get into more traditional retail stores? Because that's where the majority of Vermonters and other people shop. So we have to crack that nut. And it's not easy. It's more complicated and complex than the institutional markets. And we need to understand how it works so that our producers have the best chance possible to get their products in there. And what about uh, school meals through the farm to plate? There's some of those groups. Uh, do you work yes. anything with them? Yep. Because there's a lot of meals that yep. are handed out. Yep, there. yep. I mean, I think universal school meals is really critical. The the um, the additional uh, local per plate additional cost that you guys did last year yeah. is really important. It makes a big difference um, to their school's ability to source more. Um, farm to school is the net whole farm to school network is very much a part of, of farm to plate and. Jake serves on the on the um, common circle. Common circle. Like, okay. Yeah. yeah. So we're part of that organizing, yeah. like higher level coordinating. Again, so we have coordination, so we have alignment, so we can maximize uh, and not duplicate effort. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Brian. So if somebody were to ask me, between you and me, what you guys like your elevator pitch, what you do. How would you describe it? Yeah. Just sure. So we is it, is it really getting local local food onto the plates yes. of Vermonters and restaurants? Yes. And that's your that's that's what drives you you guys every day. Yes. Okay. Whether yes. it's in schools or yeah. restaurants. It's, okay. It's that's increasing helpful. local consumption of locally produced food. But yeah. in order to do that, yeah, we have to understand all the ways that that happens yeah. and where there are bottlenecks, right. where there's challenges, where things are working good that need to be amplified and expanded yeah. and scaled properly. Okay. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what we are guided by is the three outcomes of this legislative, the, the legislation that makes this, uh, and that's on, if you look on, if you switch now to the plan, yeah. and we'll just hand it over to Jacob in a minute, page six, up at the top, our the, what guides us is the is the statute of increasing sustainable economic development and create jobs in, in Vermont's food and farm sector, Great. improve soils, water resiliency, and working landscape in the face of climate change, and improve access to healthy local food for all Vermonters. That is that is mission one for right. us, and we have set as Jake will mention, you know, we have set a target that by 2030, we would like to get to 25% local food consumption in the state. We're at 16 as of 2020. It's a big lift. There's a lot of, you know, we got a lot of the low hanging fruit was taken care of. The, the stuff that's ahead of us is harder. But, I, but what we've noticed is that people are even more focused and more like, like straight ahead, like we, this committed and motivated to, to move things forward. <laughs> And I will say um, that this, what we're doing in Vermont is not in isolation. A um, couple things to know, this plan is considered the gold standard in the whole country. Wow. People look to this. We've gotten phone calls from, had, had the pandemic not happened, I would have been on a plane to South Korea to give a 15 minute talk about Vermont farm to plate. <laughs> Jake would have been for a whole week on a speaking tour in Australia. <laughs> Is that Literally, right? like when the pandemic hit, yeah. we had to cancel plans. I had to make a decision on a Friday. Well, like, <laughs> the Saturday before I was flying out. Well, if you'd have gone, you might have still been there. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. My brother works for the airlines, and he said, "Jake, you're if you go, you're not coming back." Yeah. <laughs> right. So well, that's tempting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Except he had a one-year-old, so <laughs> that was <wasn't laughs> <it. laughs> yeah. So yeah. the point is, is that this we, what we're doing in Vermont is being watched across the country and in other parts of the of the on the planet, and um, it is we are the leading edge, the trendsetter <laughs> for the other five New England states, hmm. right? I'm I'm actively involved with our counterparts in the other five New England states. As Senator Starr knows, we yeah. um, we have a project called New England Feeding New England. We saw and, that, yeah. And we're trying to get to the point of. We, we've set a target, which is going to be wicked hard to, to reach, if not really, yeah, um, but to get to 30% by 2030 in regional food consumption. 
what that means is Vermont <laughs> and Maine need to increase our food production, which means we need to secure our land base. We need more access to, to, um, to getting more ag land in product, back into production. We need to be able to get, have a, a greater ability to get Vermont pr products to the southern New England markets, get into those markets, get into grocery stores where most people shop. Um, and that involves distribution, that involves storage and aggregation yeah. facilities, it involves more sure. processing, you know. So, so the work that we're doing in Vermont has been, over the last 10 years, has been to solidify and strengthen our leadership and our ability to, to produce more and move more food into the Vermont market, but also the rest of New England. And then this next 10 year period is how do we how do we really scale that and and do even more because we know that the majority of, of of Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, other than maybe the Pioneer Valley in Massachusetts and maybe a little bit over near Gloucester and some of the seafood, most of the production happens in Maine and Vermont for the southern New England. They are the eaters. We are the producers, right? And what about what about our processing? Uh, ability <clears throat> uh, and if it, food is processed here then it needs to be distributed from here uh, is is that coming along with the additional growers and and people that are bringing this to our you know, forefront. Yeah, do you want to you want to take that one? Because there's been, I mean, there's so many more smaller distributors now than there were even 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of the food hubs that started up in the 20, 2010 or a few years before that have now, um, you know, evolved and scaled and they're, they're actually moving food into, you know, the, the mid-Atlantic even at this point um, in coordination with other regional food hubs. Um, so looking more to the Boston area, New York City, you know, those metropolitan areas. Um, but the, some of the issues around that are infrastructure for distribution. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about you know, having trucks, it's about having cross docking that allows for efficient you know, exchange of and packing and then movement of that food to, to the locations that need it. So, um, that's an area that is ripe for investment. I think also just thinking strategically as a region about where those locations are, where they can improve efficiencies. Um, there's yeah, and then there's also just a lot of labor shortages in trucking itself. So that's a big, uh, a big issue as well that's holding back some of our distribution. Um, and then but, yeah, where warehousing and storage. So you've got you know different types of storage a needs. Plan like uh, where these. Uh, buildings or processors should be located, and we we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, we have there is a rec there's a specific recommendation to f to fund the development of of that plan because it isn't you know something willy nilly that you just kind of point at a oh, no. <laughs> somewhere I mean, on a map. It's got to be yeah, there's all planned and thought through. exactly, and 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 a, one of yeah one of the big impediments to say getting into New York City is. When you start getting into the city, things start slowing down, and with all of the hour requirements for drivers and, and other issues, gas prices, Parking, right? Though unloading, ha having full trucks there and back becomes really essential to make the you know the distribution business um, cost efficient. So, working out those issues at a very like analytical level is something that we're interested in looking to do um, more of, and to have then more of a, a plan that we can say we need investment in these 10 facilities in these locations. Yeah. Um, but regardless of that, I think like our, our, our independent distributors, our food hubs, they have also just uh, storage um, and say cross docking infrastructure needs just for their own sites right now that they clearly could probably put together a number and it, it'd be in the, you know, we're talking like millions um, just in, you know, amongst a number of distributors in the state of Vermont. See, with the ACRA funds, but those, those go away in 26. Yeah. We've only got, you know, a few years of that left, but, you know, we ought to be getting some of that money to put into the food systems. Yeah. 
to protect our people so that we have you know yeah have a system we we should have one well set up but we've only got uh, what uh, three four years to yeah capitalize on that yeah money. and i i also i know that um there are you know some conversations happening around how can federal transportation dollars be used more for these types of food infra infrastructure, tra transportation infrastructure projects. Um, so trying to connect more dots there, or, or you know, sort of move move money uh, at the federal level to the state level, then to these uh, you know food food infrastructure distribution infrastructure needs. I think is another potentially right area. And I think the uh, the IRA bill from the federal government, the uh, Infrastructure yeah, Reinvestment right. Act, is probably more applicable than ARPA uh, in from because one of the things, for instance, you all approved last year a one-time $2 million to add to the Working Lands Enterprise Fund. Yeah. It turns out that it was ended up being ARPA dollars rather than general fund dollars. And as a result, those $2 million are heavily restricted. It can yeah. only go yeah. for actual farm producers or loggers. Can't even go to sawmill owners, right, on the, on the working land side. So the point is, is that those dollars, the ARPA dollars, are very focused on proving that you have a COVID negative impact. Yeah. The reality is what we really want to be doing at this point is investing in the future. Yeah. And that's not what ARPA was designed for. No. Right, but the IRA bill is so the infrastructure getting the re, the infrastructure uh, bill like better dialed in in terms of what the opportunities are for individual businesses or for the state to go after. That's where we think the bigger play and and the transportation money, those kinds of things that um, that that's where the money could get move in in service to what we really need on the distribution front. Do we have? Do you know if we have any? Uh, these produce growers that are making a living from what they're growing are the the larger ones absolutely the challenge with the larger ones they have been around longer and succession is a big challenge because they many of them do not have the next generation lined up some of them are the largest producers in the state and so there's a little bit of a crisis for sure that we're that we're that we're like <laughs> right we, part of it is and we and and again i'll hand it over to jake here but the the um one of the recommendations is that we need more boots on the ground of people that are that are technical and business service providers because what we don't have is enough people who are skilled in helping to work with farm families to help them with their succession plan which sometimes can take three to five years to to make to make happen, right? See, it's not Gus, so I thought Gus always had somebody that worked. They're adding, but it's still not enough. It's like the, the, the scale of what the problem is is not something that adding one or two more people is going to do it. It, it. it really needs to be, we counted up from the, all the recommendations from the different briefs, you know, there's like 33 additional service providers that were needed. And that's not just succession. That's like yeah. technical aspects around yeah. vegetable production, getting into wholesale markets, working with distributors, like the whole range, more business planners, the whole range of service providers, including environmental uh, and, and uh, working on and water quality, soil health, all those kinds of technical types uh, of, of entities. So the point is, is that it's not just putting more land into production and then just like, oh, okay, we got, you know, 500,000 more acres going. It's like, you gotta have the capital, you gotta have the people, you gotta have the, the infrastructure that's the right type of infrastructure, yeah. you gotta have the technical service and business planner service providers, you know, helping to figure out what's the business model that's gonna work. All those kinds of things go together. Yeah, we, we uh, on the just succession planning technical assistance alone, we accounted for additional FTEs needed, two, two dedicated to dairy, two for other types of farms, and I think produce would probably be you know, definitely one of those two. Yeah. Um, so. So, so these people, they've been at it long enough, so they, they're old enough to move, retire. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And you think about the deep root co-op, organic co-op, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of the growers are in your area and then Southern Quebec, they're all in their 60s and 70s. Yeah. And they're yeah. some of the, the most experienced, the, 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 the largest acres under production selling into wholesale markets. We're really worried about them. And, and, and then I think on the, the younger side is there are profitable, you know, young produce uh, producers who are probably right now leasing you know, land from some of those more Turn established growers. Oh, right. Yeah, right. And, and they might be you know, leasing five to 10 acres looking to purchase, but now purchasing five to 10 acres is a potentially a million dollar uh, deal rather than you know, hundreds of thousands uh, or low hundreds yeah. of now, thousands. Now, even working through the land trust, it gets to be very expensive. Yeah, because I don't see why they couldn't grow veggies on conserved land. And a lot, it, I mean that the conservation process is, takes time. So sometimes trying to line up how quickly that can happen with how quickly you need to get onto a parcel of land uh, to really make your business grow. You know, lining those things up takes time. And I think the rate at which we need things to happen is quicker than the rate at which the tools we have right now allow for change. So. Yeah. Uh, Brian, would you define for me uh, what a food hub is, what what it is, and where they are in the states right now? Yeah, yeah. I wish I had the uh, the formal definition. Sure. But no, but yeah. just a general. Yeah. Just give me a sense. So you can think of it as. Um, I mean, it could. It's oftentimes it, the term is used for nonprofits, but it could be a okay. for profit that uh, aggregates, stores, and distributes food. Uh, that's okay. you know, and, and part of that could also be marketing the marketing and sales of yeah. of that food. Um, so there might be like a brand component uh, to it, um, and in in relation to like food hubs, um, you know, they emerged as meeting a market need to sell local food to institutions because institutions needing more like volume. Yeah. You know, rather than buying from individual producers, could go to a food hub who could say, "Yep, we've got you know the the volume of carrots you need that we're sourcing from multiple yeah. farms." So they provide also, I think, like a logistics service in that as well. I know Hardwick, I think, mm -hmm. does. No, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. There. Center for Ag Economy. I mean, they they took over the operation of Farm Connects, Farm Connects yeah. Yeah. right, which was an independently owned. But then when he wanted to retire. They needed. They were going to lose all the trucks on the road, and mm -hmm. so the Center for Ag Economy, which is, which also manages the Vermont uh, Food Venture Center, they took over that distribution business. And now, what are they? I mean, John's got like ten trucks on the road. Something yeah, like that. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's grown it's exponentially. And and they Farm Connect services Green Mountain Farm to School, so they are in essence like the freight service for Green Mountain Farm to School. But Green Mountain Farm to School takes in the orders and. Um, they are like the platform for schools to order the food. And where are they in Vermont right now? Where are our food hubs? Uh, so there's the Farm Connects, which is Northeast yeah. Kingdom. Yeah. We have Food Connects down in Brattleboro. Okay. Um, Service is a little bit of anything. Yeah, right? and and the, and uh, and then there's the Intervale Food Hub. Um, we used to have the Mad River Food Hub, but that is now. Oh, is that gone? Yeah, um, I think they might still distribute beer technically. No, okay. I don't think. Okay. No, that's not a part the of the yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there's also the uh, um, uh, Farmers, food Farmers Food Center in yeah. Rutland. Um, and then there's also Acorn in Addison, which is the Addison County like, relocalization Local. network. Um, and and so, so uh, Green Mountain Farm to School, um, uh, Intervale, Food Connects, and CAE work, they, they also have a collaborative agreement. Um, so they're trying to work out like shared inventory and sales um, and logistics of, you know, Farm Connects sort of taking in uh, a, an order and then moving it to, or Food Connects taking an order, but getting that product from say Farm Connects up in Hardwick. But when we first started and these, and these nonprofits in, in particular were just really getting going, I think at the time, Intervale was probably at about 400,000, 500,000 in sales, something like that. 
And now collectively combined, I bet they're what, they're probably north of five million together. So it has really grown. Uh, they're, they're moving a lot more food and they're doing a lot of the last mile stuff that is the hardest. And it's stuff, they're picking up stuff that Black River Produce will never will no longer do because they were taken over by Reinhardt, which then was taken over by um, Performance, Performance Food Group, one of the largest uh, distributors in the country multiple billion dollar business so um uh so yeah they they serve an important role and and part of what they've been trying to do is to get to scale some of them are thinking about spinning off the food distribution component to being an l3c private enterprise rather than a nonprofit. that's all still in very much in discussion but you know they're they're sort of growing up so to speak um as as food hubs just as this work uh, in food systems has been growing up over the last 10 years so and they're we got not a the big appropriate. I don't know if you've, have you helped with the Bennington one. We got the appropriation from Welch. It's, I think yeah. it's getting close to. We'll have to talk. Okay. Yeah. There's some challenges. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's yeah there's definitely some some funding um, needs. The you know the Working Lands Enterprise uh, Board has definitely been trying to to, to uh, encourage proposals and fund proposals that. Uh, that are strengthening that distribution and storage and aggregation function uh, within the food system. So um, there has been a lot of movement in that area, but more, more to come. But you would think that, um, you know, if, if you're a farmer and you sell your property to the, through the land trust or conservation mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. um, I don't see why if if we're putting the money into, in, in others uh, to buy those conservation yep. uh, rights, why some of that shouldn't be kind of certain pieces of it shouldn't be set aside for vegetable and produce because you, mm -hmm. you can't grow veggies in certain types of soil. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most farms have a combo of soil types, right. Right. and most farms are, you know, we have a lot of people that want to have small farms, and um, I don't see why they need a, a, an 80 or 100 cow size farm to keep 50 on or 40 on. and why some of that land couldn't be mm -hmm. set aside to uh, be sold to a veggie producer. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. You know, there's, you can't afford, I don't think you can afford to pay uh, a four, four right. or $5,000 an acre right. for property to grow veggies. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of my uh, uh, neighbors of a sort, a couple miles down the road, that we have a that we're he's who we buy our winter CSA share from, uh, Burnt Rock Farm. It's in Hanksville, Huntington area, and it's in the Huntington River Valley there. And you know, he started off, bought an old uh, farmhouse, and and he actually had originally worked for David Zuckerman uh, on Full Moon Farm before starting off on his own. I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. And, um, you know, he started off with, I think, probably about less, about 10 acres, something like that, a little less than 10 acres, diversified. He decided he was going to not do, he did winter farmer's markets, winter farmer's market, and he was going to really focus on wholesale production of root crops and stuff that was like winter storage crops. That was going to be his niche. And he has steadily grown that business incredibly. I've watched it over the years. But what he has to do to get enough land to grow, like he's maxed out his home farm site. You you probably have driven through the Huntington River Valley, right? Yeah. There's like a little two acres here and a little five acres there. And there's like tucked back behind some houses, five acres there. And he has methodically gone after to get either leases or buy those parcels up because there's nobody, you know, otherwise they're gonna be paid uh, or, or Orange, um, or nothing, or nothing. Or nothing yeah. and he's added I think he's now up to 25 acres but it has taken him a long time and it's not contiguous so he has to stage where his 
where his uh, tractors and, and, and stuff, and they're spending a lot of time on the road moving tractors and moving material and moving bins when they've done harvesting because they can't act, get access to a, a large enough contiguous piece. On the flip side, as you say, uh, a dairy farm, let's say, that wants to sell uh, two, 200 acres or 100 acres, like he's never going to be able to afford that. He's, and he doesn't no. need that many acres. Good. So how do you, what's the legal structure that's needed to try to get multiple farmers on that property? Is that land, like, is it going to be conventional organic? If it's going to be organic, then you got three year cycle before you can actually get certification. You, if you buy a farm that was a dairy farm, all of a sudden you've got all this infrastructure that you have to pay for, but you may not need it. And you need, you need different types of infrastructure. So a lot of young farmers get on property, they spend all of their money to get on the land. They get help you know, from lots of different sources, but then you need working capital. You need the money to be able to buy the hoop house and the, the extra bigger tractor. And the, like, there's all of those additional costs that come into it when you're gonna do that kind of a, tr of a transition. And that's not to say that it doesn't happen, because it does. The challenge is we don't have enough funding that's moving in that direction that enables it to be possible for that next generation. They don't come from a farm family, but they really want uh, to get into farming, the business of farming. It's, it can be really challenging unless you come from money. Unless you come from money. Unless you it's come from money. It's absolutely right because they can't borrow any money. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I have a piece of land and right behind it, 35 acres in the floodplain. It's number one floodplain. The development rights were sold. It just sold for $5,000 an acre, $175,000 yeah. for land in the floodplain yeah. that the development rights are gone and no young person mm -hmm. can no. go any place and get the financing yeah. to get on to the property then let alone buy your tractors buy your equipment to right. get organized um uh, you know it, it, yeah i said yesterday with um, um a young farmer who's filling out a grant to buy, um, and this is bigger than you, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, um, um, uh, a no-till cedar. Yeah. And can get a grant for between five and $40,000. For the cedar? For the cedar, and the cedar's gonna cost 100,000. Yeah, yeah. So. I think he ought to share with somebody. But then you got to be able. You got to be adjacent. You got to. You got to be able to transport it. Right, and and those I mean, first five years of the of the business are probably the, the hardest to establish the the cash flow to be profitable as well. So now you're carrying higher land costs, higher equi equipment and infrastructure costs. You're trying to maybe get rid of infrastructure, which requires capital. So the the conditions facing new young farmers is much different now than it was. In 1960 in Vermont, you know, the, just the capital requirements alone are, are astronomically yeah, different. I don't see it as much different than the 1960s or 70s um, you know, for even with farm fields. They did no planning then. Hmm. They, are, um, they aren't doing planning now. And, then, um, and the generation handing off is looking for their retirement and the investment that they have in yeah. the mm -hmm. property and the land. And the next generation has to pay to retire. Mm -hmm. I watched that with my father, mm -hmm. and he retired. He bought my grandfather out in 1971. Mm -hmm. But it's the same basic yep. issues. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. <sighs> so why don't we shift over to walking you through the plan and how to use it, if that is yep. okay no, with that's, you? That's good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so hopefully by the end of this, what seems like a very large document will actually be accessible to you all. Um, and, and as I go through this, you'll see that there, there will be different ways that you can reference and use this. You can go really deep or you can be very selective in, in how you reference it. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to use it um, to what you're interested in. Um, and as Ellen mentioned, uh, so in 2019, the Farm to Play Investment Program was reauthorized, so established the need to create another 10-year strategic plan, which this is. 
And with that, um, the three outcomes of that legislation really flow through the entirety of this. And, and that is, uh, you know, again, on page six. So increase sustainable economic development, create jobs in Vermont's food and farm sector. So that's the real economic development and, and economic viability. Then the second is improve soils, water, and resiliency of the working landscape in the face of climate change. So we've got that you know, sustainability, environmental sustainability and resiliency component. And then the last one, improve access to healthy local foods for all Vermonters. So really trying to have equity in the system, everyone has access to it. Um, and you will find those three outcomes really are reflected throughout this. And, and then also note that we added a commitment to racial equity because those three don't happen if we in fact don't have a consider considerations for racial equity in, in all of them. Um, and so, you know, a food system that leaves people behind is not sustainable, is not economically successful or, um, you know, or environmentally sustainable. Um, so th that is just, uh, you know, keep that in mind as, as you go through this, that really that's the foundation. Um, and then uh, if you turn to page, uh, let's see, it's nine, um, there's an understanding the plan. You might not be able to see the page number, so look for <laughs> page eight. Um, and so what we, what we do is taking those three outcomes, the commitment to racial equity, is then the plan has a vision, right, of what do we want the food system to look like in 2030? What does it feel like? Um, and that, that also is a way in which to just, you know, always kind of guide us in what we're doing. Um, from the vision, there's then 15 strategic goals. Uh, so those are the high level signposts of, you know, the directions we want to go in. Um, each, each goal has measurable objectives, and I'll talk more about each of these as we go through. So, so we have actually measurable indicators for all of our goals to at least give us a signal of progress. Like how are we, you know, it, it helps us ask the question, how are we doing on these goals? And then we have the priority strategies, which are the actual, what are the actual programs, investments, policies that we need to do in order to get to our goals to fulfill this vision uh, that we've created for our food system. And those priority strategies, so there's 34, but they're a distillation of what are 276 recommendations from uh, product, market, and issue briefs, which I'm gonna go to next. So, um, so know that we have, uh, we have these briefs that are dedicated to a particular topic, and from that there's recommendations in each of those. And what we did was looking at all of the recommendations together, tried to synthesize them into 34 priority strategies. So that, that's a better way of kind of seeing that you know, these recommendations relate in this way and that there's a priority strategy that we can look to that if we implement has a big impact on a lot of different recommendations. Um, so let me go to the, uh, the briefs because that'll be a good place um, you know, topically to orient you to what is included in this plan. Um, so if you go to page 37, and that's also um, why, why the document is so large is there, there are 54 of these briefs that are, two, most of them are two pages, there's a few that are four, and the dairy brief is eight. Um, so they're meant to be short and accessible um, you know, and cover cover issues in, in a very standardized way so you can kind of start to you, synthesize. You can see, like, this is the briefs yeah. and this is the plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it, a lot so, of good material for exactly. people to do backup. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And so um, the way it's organized, as you'll see in the, the table of contents, is uh, we have a little description of the methodology, but then the product briefs, um, there's a, an, another table of contents on page 39, the market briefs are on page 99, and then the issue briefs on page 121. So let's go to the product briefs on 39, which is actually just turn the page. So here are all the products that we've covered in more depth um, and detail uh, listed here uh, and by page number. So anything from agroforestry to goats, grapes, hops, produce, spirits, swine, if you have any questions about what's happening in any of those product categories or what the specific needs or market trends are, you can reference these briefs to do that. To um, that page that... Yeah, and so let's, let's... So pick one. What do you want to know about? Um, 
I want to know how the bees are doing. <laughs> yep. uh, yes. There you go. All right, let's go bees and honey. Right, so 47. 47. <laughs> so what you'll find is that each of these briefs, including bees and honey, uh, opens with a, a what's at stake statement. Um, and that really gives you the most concise statement about really like what's important, what to be thinking about, what to focus your attention on, sort of main issues and challenges in a very concise statement. From that what's at stake, then every brief has a current conditions section, which gives you some data, the most, re you know, the most recent data that we have on that, mm -hmm. um, some summary of key trends or um, just things that have happened over the years, and then usually there's a featured um, you know, infographic or data um, on the, on the right-hand side. So in this case, colony losses by county is, is the featured data piece. Then on the second page, after you get a sense of the conditions, then we summarize bottlenecks and gaps, and then opportunities. And then from that, we go to recommendations. So in this way, as you get a sense of the bottlenecks and gaps, the opportunities, they should flow into then the recommendations to either take advantage of the opportunities or address the bottlenecks and gaps. Yep. Um, and in that way, again, you know, really quick way to, to reference things, to understand and differentiate between, you know, what, what are the strengths we have here that could be opportunities or what are the gaps and things that need ad addressing or further investment or investigation. Um, and so yeah, those then each usually has around five recommendations. Some might have a little more, some might have a little less. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, and then yes, also note that these briefs are, uh, you know, not just written by the VSJF staff or Ellen and I, these are all written by a content expert, which is listed the lead author and then they, uh, worked with a team of contributing authors who are also other content experts. Um, so this you know, is, is coming from a community of experts who have spent their, you know, their life and experiences around this product area. Um, but when, we, when we solicited lead authors and encouraged, you know, helped them to identify the contributors, one of the things that we told them we wanted was, this is not about creating recommendations that one organization thinks is the, is the idea here, right? This, we, wanted, we wanted them to represent, in this case, say, the entire bee and honey community. Mm -hmm. And we wanted, any, we wanted to get to a point where if some other beekeeper who wasn't part of the process read this, they would be like, ah. That, that about summarizes it. You know, it's like about 80%, 80 to 90%, like, yeah, I agree with what's in there. Because we wanted to create these product, these briefs in a way that would give you guys guidance and to know and have confidence that if you read this, the folks, the, the business folks connected to this brief are going to be like, yeah, that's about, that's, 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 I can get behind that. That's about right. And I, and I think um, the other thing to note too about these recommendations is that some of them are very, you might say prescriptive, like they're, they're very concise, they're directed at a very specific thing. Others might be a little more general, so there's more room to navigate what the policy solution is or the amount of money required, yeah. or there might be further testimony that could fulfill, you know, kind of fill this out um, and, and give more specifics to what's needed. Um, so, so they're not, meant to be interpreted as, as like, this is the, the, by the word, what needs to happen. There is room to interpret and investigate further, but it, at least it gives you that, you know, a sense of, of direction and some specifics as to what, what could impact uh, the industry. But if you were going to have somebody come in to talk to you about eggs or, go or goats, before they come in, read the two-pager, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Give us a lot. Yeah. So, so when yeah. is this going to be legal? Uh, we we published it in February twenty one. And is there going to be some periodic review in the future to say we should update this in progress reports yep. based upon this? You know, I went yeah, right to the slaughterhouse be. piece and started reading that in. Um, and I know exactly who I'm going to take that to. Yeah, I like it. The, I like the, it. the whole yeah. layout of this, and every I really like it. But yeah, how often should yeah. we upgrade this? Mm -hmm. And 
um, will we by section get a progress report? Are we making any ground? Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you might make it to the next three right. <laughs> make it to the next what? We're right. We're right. We're right. Well, with my color here, I'll probably be gone. Right? It, or, and, and if it is 20 years before it's done again. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I didn't even 10 now. <laughs> you only got seven to go. So a, a, a few ways in which we'll, we'll track progress and in essence keep, you know, up, update this is, you know, our, so that's our annual reports are meant to be a reflection of changes and and also uh, referencing what the baseline is from the plan. Uh, and then also we do have, so we have a, a master spreadsheet where we are tracking uh, the, the recommendations individually um, and, and accounting for major changes. And then also um, we have you know, I mentioned there's measurable objectives tied to each goal. So we have indicators of aggregate data that we can say is a reflection of, you know, the changes that have happened in this industry. You know, you can see some of that in the changes in these indicators, um, which those are updated uh, on different schedules depending on when data becomes available. Um, and I think, pro you know, probably we'll do a, a mid-10, like a five-year uh, process of reflecting on where this stands and summarizing, synthesizing the progress. Um, in the Ag Census, for instance, which has so much of the data that helps, mm -hmm. especially on the product briefs, only comes out, is collected every five years. Mm -hmm. And then it takes another couple of years after they've collected it before we actually get the data. So there's always a lag. So, uh, so for instance, when we did the first plan in 2011, we published it in 20, in fiscal year 2015, we did do that sort of midpoint check-in and we were able to use the latest census data, which had, was already at that point three years old, technically, um, but that was the best we could do in terms of what's the available data. So we'll do that as same. I, I just worry about yeah. this because if I look at, and you've got a section on beer, you've got a section yeah. on, um, if I look at that, those businesses, it, it, and, yeah. and, and we sat here last week talking about cheese and, those business areas are changing so, yeah. so fast now. Yeah. That yes. and and if this is I'm just yeah. great. Yeah. 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 It would be yeah. a great too, but yes. you can't wait ten years. Totally get it. Yeah. yeah, totally get it. And that's part of the reason why we developed the farm to plate network of all the organizations that are part of the food system to actually be working on the implementation because that's going to give us the ability to make adjustments and to address problems as they are arising and, and not at this sort of static point where we take a snapshot of what's going on. Yeah. So how does the policy interact with the Global Warming Solutions Act? Because I know ag has a certain reduction that it has to meet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand this was published before it was passed, Yeah. but there are a bunch of things that have to be done. Yeah. And so how do you kind of connect those two yeah. to get so that ag meets its goals. Yeah. Um, so the, the uh, yeah, there's, there's also a climate change uh, brief, but, um, you know, the, yeah, the mitigation requirements of the, uh, of the climate plan and, and legislation, um, you know, have our man mandates in essence of reduction. Yeah. Then there are also the, the the adaptation and resiliency components of the plan that don't have m measurable targets, which is where there are a lot of additional food system recommendations contained in the climate action plan. So there's some question of you know how how do we how do we put actual teeth or force to the, that part of the plan? Or um, recommendations. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. And and those recommendations, as Ellen said before. Um, are in many cases adapted or or straight adopted from this plan. Um, so you will see references, recommendations that m might look exactly the same in the climate action plan in certain sections as they do here. Um, but those are most likely going to be in the uh, more related to adaptation resiliency <laughs> aspects, not the mandated mitigation reduction targets. Um, so that's, I don't know if that's, <laughs> that might not answer it directly, but, um, because yeah, so we didn't know, we didn't know what those targets goals. So yeah. that, that'll come out. 
in right. time. Then, how how you might recommend if there's something a beekeeper does or a dairy or right. or poultry, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think the you know because this came out before, we yeah. didn't we didn't know what the the regulatory right. targets were going yeah. to be. Yeah. And now, you know, the agency of ag has has a mandate to regulate right. towards those those targets okay. for agriculture as a sector. Thanks. Yeah. When when you were uh, putting all the products together and talking with people, uh, was there ever any value associated with um, producing certain products that carried the Vermont name uh, to market? Uh, and if that did that make a difference to some people? Yeah, so if you go in in the issue briefs, which start on page 121, then there is a consumer demand uh, issue brief on page 145. Uh, and the mark, yeah, and marking in 169, but the the consumer demand brief on 145 does a good job of uh, synthesizing um, yeah, consumer market trends and preferences and, and also looking at past research on this issue. And I think um, you know, there are cases where, yes, the Vermont name and brand means something, but it's usually to people who've had an experience here in Vermont. So they have- I'm Here, not yeah. elsewhere. And, and for those that don't, uh, the notion of the Vermont brand doesn't necessarily carry as much value or weight in the marketplace. They're looking more at then specific attributes around health um, or the, you know, the taste, the quality of, of the product. Um, and, and that has gotten very um, competitive. You know, we're seeing that happen for, you know, no longer can you say the product is organic and that just sways a consumer to buy it. It's gotta be organic. That's you know, grass-fed that uh, you know, has, has these health benefits and really a lot of uh, you know, value-laden attributes to products now. So it's, it's much harder to gain the consumer's, uh, their, their attention and their loyalty to your product. And so yeah, the Vermont brand has limitations in that in the marketplace right now. But for those who have been to Vermont and have that experience, Vermont then becomes a signifier for all the things that they, you know, sign that they've experienced here, um, and that's a quick reference for them to say, oh, you know, I know, I know what Vermont's about. That has Vermont on it. It must be good, um, <laughs> and they, they have a trust in it. Yeah. Yeah. And on that one forty five page. Um, yeah. Farm uh, raised. Uh, farm. Uh, seafood. Yeah. What went on? What went on with those two? Uh, is there something there that? Yes, I think that that speaks to um, consumer preferences, where say for farm farm seafood not carrying significant the same the significance for a consumer about the sustainability of the product. If they if they see it as farm seafood, they think. Oh, there's maybe a lot of energy use going into that. Why isn't it wild caught? Um, you know, it might not be as good as something that's wild caught. Um, yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. So farm raised might be that they're raised on the farm and then they go to a finisher CAFO, right? As opposed to grass fed, has a higher uh, awareness around that yeah. maybe the animals are treated better. Like, I mean, and and of course, a lot of this stuff is perception. Oh, yeah. Right, because yeah. we don't actually have a label in this country with stringent rules around what does it mean to be grass-fed, mm -hmm. which yeah. we call attention to as something we need, because you don't know if that means grass in the barn that you feed them or grass yeah. out in the field well, for a they... month or yeah. the whole life yeah. or and there's yeah there's federal labeling issues with. Um, product that gets is raised say in Argentina it gets processed through a Cargill facility in the Midwest it then gets a sticker that says uh, you a US product or you know made and and, and that grass-fed product then is sold at a much lower price and takes premiums away from 
uh, producers in our region. So that's there's some federal issues here as well. Yeah. So we've also got these market briefs. So there's also market briefs on look at page 99. So it gets at some of your questions uh, around hospitals and colleges and distribution. And yeah, you'll see distribution is in the market brief section because seeing distribution as the means to reach all of those markets in different ways. Um, Yeah. So, All sorts of topics. Um, so obviously, there's there's much more time that you can spend um, <laughs> with all of these briefs, and then to know that as we're going to shift over to talking about the priority strategies. But before we do that, I want to reference also there's a table in the back, um, page 193. So on page 193, now you'll see where I was talking about. The priority strategies are, in some cases, in a lot of cases, a synthesis of a lot of recommendations. Um, and this table shows you that connection. Um, so you can see for any priority strategy, you can then see the, the individual recommendations that make up that strategy. Um, so then you can, if, if you're really, if you're seeing that a lot of things that you're interested in in a brief are tied to a priority strategy four, then you can draw your, bring your attention to that priority strategy and think about, you know, okay, how does how do we implement policy uh, around this uh, to implement the strategy? Um, and it also gets to, to Jake's point that these, if you can, if you can solve for one of the priority strategies, it has a ripple effect across a lot of different products, markets, and issues potentially, depending on how many bullets are in that right-hand column. You know, you take a look at at number eight, for instance, on product-specific value chain, page 195, producers, distributors, and buyers together at matchmaking events. That, that all those those that concept of matchmaking between producers and buyers showed up in all of these different briefs that that are listed there, right? Which me, and we we wanted to create this table because it was a way to help us understand like how like what well, what's really the nub of the problem and if we solve that one problem it will have that ripple effect across multiple products and markets and and issues and um, so it's more strategic uh, it's a scalpel well done. Uh, yes sir <clears throat> how is this being distributed um, so <laughs> yeah uh, our, we designed our whole website around basically this new this new plan so so on one on the website is you can access all of this content there's a plan specific page um, you can look at actually the briefs online uh, individually and you don't need to download How does them some young farmer or somebody know to reach out to go AgriView actually has um, the agency, because we did this in partnership with the agency all along the way, they have every month chosen one of the briefs to highlight and it's almost published like exactly in, in there. We also have a, a, an e-newsletter that has about 8,000 subscribers and many farmers are, are, get that. And we fe so we feature uh, uh, different brief content from the, the strategic plan in the, every newsletter. Um, trying to direct it towards a specific topic and then say like learn more you know go to the plan go to the website it, um, our we have we have listservs of of our members that um, we distribute this content to um, which you know that includes over 300 members and their organizations um, yeah I know there's TA providers who have uh, you know who are working with farms or might be working with us slaughter facility that you know have have this on hand or know to reference it um, so there's a lot of different yeah ways that this information gets out actually into the world um, and that said we have we do have some copies they're 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 as you can, you can imagine being fully color they're not in it, they're not inexpensive to produce but if somebody calls us up and they said I really I really want a hard copy we will are happy to send them yeah, those out-of-staters, they must like to have a hard copy somewhere kicking around to promote to promote this kind of stuff when they go to meetings, I would think. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a lot of people no, definitely it's reference it and use it. So you want to jump in with some yes. strategies? So, so just la just lastly, um, coming back to the priority strategies, which are on page 30, or the list starts on page 30, um, you'll see that, and I'll just wait for a minute to get there. Um, so each priority strategy, you'll see there's a, a colored icon that follows it. So that is reference to the specific goal number and, and goal category that that priority strategy um, so is, is oriented to. So yeah. it's num number one, we, you know, providing the at least one and a half million for annual funding to the Working Lands Enterprise Fund um, that touches upon you know, the economic sort of development area, which is the purple color and specifically goals one and three, um, and then also six and eight around environmental sustainability. So you have that additional system of reference that you can, you can see how these strategies relate to achieving our strategic goals. Um, and just to, I, yeah, I won't go into depth on each of these priority strategies, but just wanna call out some themes here. So one obviously is WeLab, which um, we said we we're we we're strategic in saying at least one and a half million for annual funding, knowing that um, it'd be great if it was more than that. And obviously there is a, re a request to make it more this year, but uh, stabilizing that base um, is, is also really essential and a, is, is a part of what this strategy is speaking to um, for business planning. And that's just, been usually yeah. one-time money right. thrown in. Yeah. And, yeah, and having that predictability is, is really important. Um, and the demand is certainly there, as we've been talking about. There's a lot of infrastructure needs and just you know transition funding and financing that's needed for farms at this point. Uh, two and three speak to uh, developing funding mechanisms, funding opportunities uh, that meet very uh, specific uh, food system investment gaps and also particularly for underserved populations, you know, BIPOC, women, um, and, and others. Um, so that's what two and three covers. Five is the is the dairy uh, strategy, priority strategy. Um, six is meat, uh, anything related to meat processing, uh, meat development. Seven and eight are, um, as as alluded to earlier, um, you know, the 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 need for not only just processing or distribution um, or storage infrastructure, but that. Each of our in industries has very specific needs around those things. So the processing needs of um, of produce growers is different than the processing needs of uh, agroforestry or, or or meat um, and livestock. Um, and and with that too, is is you know distribution infrastructure is a key for all of that. Storage is a key for all of that. So just finding those interconnections of infrastructure, but also knowing that there are specific industry needs. Um, uh, depending on the product type. Uh, nine is talks about uh, land access and, and conservation programs. Um, so there are some really you know, great established programs, but they could absolutely um, you know, innovate and, and develop additional programming with more resources. So that's what nine is, is talking about. Um, as we were referencing to earlier of there's a huge need for uh, looking at multi, you know, multi-owner uh, land ownership, um, working out the the legal, the financial aspects of that. Uh, as we have, you know, large tracts of land that may not fit the needs of one particular producer, but could meet the needs of four. Um, and so that's an area of trying to find, you know, are there policy incentives for that? Um, are are there funding sources that could support pilot projects? That kind of thing. Um, 10, 11, and 12 are about the business assistance and technical assistance um, needs that we were discussing. Um, so one, one mechanism is, is uh, VHCB and their Farm and Forest Viability Program, so making sure that they have their full allocation of, of funding. But then you know, there are very specific needs, um, whether it's the transition planning, um, but then also uh, production uh, technical assistance. So again, you know, different industries have very different production technical assistance needs, and we don't have a lot of depth uh, with that. So there's not you know, a lot of capacity for livestock um, tech production technical assistance, for example. So how can we find ways um, 
uh, to increase that capacity. Um, then looking at 15, 16, and 17, those are oriented around marketing. Um, one, the 15 talks about producer associations, so they real, play a real vital role in promoting uh, marketing their members um, and doing so on very limited uh, dollars. And then 16 talks about statewide marketing, um, so whether we're talking about Department of Tourism and Marketing or the Agency of Ag, um, just Vermont has historically under, underfunded um, our marketing um, and you know, the, the Agency of Agriculture doesn't have any specific appropriations for marketing. Department of Tourism and Marketing has, in relation to how big of an industry tourism is, has very limited um, uh, money for that. And so that's one need. And then 17 speaks more to the, the specific business marketing needs of building business owners capacity acumen to market their products or to find the services that can provide that for them. Um, and then turning the page, um, so just I wanted to call out 20, uh, it, that is a priority strategy around incentivizing the local purchasing reimbursement. So making that permanent would fulfill um, a, a priority strategy from, from the strategic plan. Um, and then uh, 22 is oriented around increasing funding for proven ways to alleviate food security. So that's where universal school meals would would fulfill um, the priority strategy. That's um, where programs like you know, maintaining funding for farm to school, um, injecting uh, or putting money into crop cash farm share programs, uh, those are all proven ways to get local food to more Vermonters, make it more accessible. Um, 24, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear more about this in the annual report, but maybe also in, in some dedicated time with the committee is, is the food security plan, which is in development. Uh, my colleague Becca Warren is working on that, and so by next end of end of this year um, and the start of next legislative session, we will have a food security roadmap that will have some more policy recommendations um, to to address food security in times of not only in times of crisis, but how do we build out um, our food security in times of relative normalcy so that we're ready for those crisis moments, and whether that's pandemic or climate related. Um, so that's what that is looking at, really making sure that you know, food supply is, is secure and stable in, in all times and that people have the ability to access food um, in all times. And there's you know, a lot of complexity obviously involved with that. Uh, 26 is about climate related, uh, climate adaptive um, uh, funding. Um, so there's a number of, of issues and, and maybe policies actually this legislative session related to that. Um, and also the climate plan is how do we kind of tie, make the connections that you know, agriculture needs more um, support to adapt to climate change. Um, and that's what 26 is speaking to. 27 is about the support for the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group. They have, I know, some recommendations coming forward about how to advance um, you know, the, the payment for ecosystem services, um, which is an important element of providing additional revenue to farms uh, uh, and acknowledging the public benefits that they're generating um, through their stewardship. Um, so uh, really continuing to support that work and also um, advancing the recommendations that come out of that group because they have spent three years of really dedicated time investigating the issue and trying to you know, find ways to uh, do that provide um, that support in a sustainable way. Um, and then lastly, is that 33 and 34 speak very directly to the issue of equity. Um, you know, 33 about all of our uh, need to commit and prioritize actions that erad eradicate structural racism in the food system. And that includes uplifting, financially compensating leadership, participation, representation of BIPOC. Um, I know the Land Access Opportunity Board, um, maybe it's out, but they are also releasing a report soon uh, that will have hopefully some uh, policy related recommendations. Um, and that work is you know, really critical to accomplishing not only you know, equity related goals, but also a lot of these, the, the other um, aspects of the strategic plan. And then 34 is, is more specific to um, just the need for some more research, data collection, investigation of racial equity 
in the food system. Um, so when our team of, of authors um, was writing the racial equity brief, there was just a notable lack of data um, on racial equity that you know makes it hard to speak to, um, to speak to policymakers about uh, the, the issues and the potential interventions that could happen to address those issues. So those are the priority strategies, and <laughs> I will stop there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that. 30 through 34, 30, yeah, through 33, I guess it is. Yeah. Uh, those are pages that we want to pay attention to. Totally. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, Richie's our man on appropriation, so if you get shorted, I, I think you, you sit blame at that table. <laughs> <laughs> if we, you I, get I, shorted, blame him. If you get an increase, well, you can call me. <laughs> I understand how this works. But I think, you know, I think you folks have done a great yep. job yeah. presenting great great this and, and what it represents is important for us to use for uh, backup to uh, issues where, you know, if we run into it, don't usually run into many problems. Uh, <laughs> Everything's a problem. Well, and you know, the, the, for Linda, um, too, given that you're always having to try to find people to testify on different things, you know, the the lead authors and the contributing authors that are oh, on these briefs are the all right group. there, right? And if you need, you know, email addresses or whatever, we're ha always happy to help yep. identify people and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, we tried to put together, pack in a lot of Im important, wow. useful information in concise as we could uh, to give you all a, a good, a good reference document to work from. No, there's a lot of um, good reference material here. It's a document that, boy, somebody wanting to get into a certain line of ag. Um, right. You know, they should be able to find some help here. And, yeah. Okay. And the names of who to call even. And, yeah. we, we had a, a, a younger person come to the office, for some, I can't remember what, but they mentioned that uh, as part of a class, they like built a business plan utilizing the plan um, and that it was, you know, a great resource for that work and really gave them clarity. And we certainly heard stories about that with the first plan mm -hmm. of helping people identify what their niche really should be versus what they thought it should be. Um, and, you know, creating successful businesses around that. I mean, the, all the food system majors at UVM and that, the, and the different food system programs, they're all using this in the classroom. As base. Really? Oh, yeah. So it's informing the next generation in terms of how to think about being entrepreneurial and all that. And I will say also on page uh, 55, the, the dairy brief um, was put together. Uh, it's the, large, the longest one, as is appropriate. Uh, but the lead author was Laura Ginsburg at the Agency of Ag, and there was a number of contributing authors. And we wanted to make sure we got a, a real mixture of different types of dairy farms that, that were part of the, the contribution of this. But I think what's important to know, Senators, is that this is, in essence, the roadmap for a lot of what is being distributed through the Vermont uh, Dairy Business Innovation Center. The strategies for how to deploy those federal funds, not only Vermont, but also the region, because it's a regional effort. You know, the, the roadmap is in here, because Laura wrote it. Oh. Yeah. So you read this, have Laura in to give you a presentation on the Dairy Business Innovation Center, and you will see how it is actually being, those funds are being deployed to, in service to this building out of uh, a transformed dairy industry that is conventional, it is organic, it is sustainable, it is viable, it's value added, it's uh, commodity, <laughs> it's the whole, the, whole, the whole way in which that program is being rolled out and, and the, the, the areas of focus for grant making, the seeds of it are all in here. Did you run into uh, any discussions about uh, having more uh, processing of dairy products or different kinds of processing of dairy product? 
like we process uh, cheese and, mm -hmm. and uh, make all kinds of cheeses, yogurts, um, ice cream. Uh, I don't know, you know, if we still ship, you know, 30 odd percent of our milk out. Right. And, you know, the value added stuff is supposedly where the money is. Right even though it has problems trickling down. Um, yeah, if you look actually on page 60, it's in the dairy brief, there's a little graphic that shows that, you know, where on-farm and off-farm processing of dairy uh, has has gone over a 10-year period. And it's it's quite remarkable. You know, it, it went from 50-something to 151 uh, of That's going from processing. That's why you need to 10 years to do this again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that, you know, we flagged attention in the first plan to the need for more on-farm and, and in-state processing infrastructure and yes. value-added processing happening, and it actually happened. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. It, it, really, it really did. Um, and so I think there is more opportunity there for sure. Where, I mean, we're doing we're really doing good yeah. for... I mean, we were advised what to do, and we actually did it. Yeah. yeah. And yet, we're still, like your chart there on the left, uh, well, that's a processing, but you you know our farm numbers are way down, uh, yep. you know, in the last from 10 yeah. to 20. It yeah. really made a, quite a dive, and, and the we, we built the, the processing to keep the value added here, but yet it never trickled down to the farmer. It got lost between the wholesalers and the retailers and, well, and the... I somewhat agree with you, but we've got nearly the same number of cows. No, it, it has, no. Well, it's dropped off a little, but not. It, it's really the small farmers that we're yeah. losing. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're getting bled out. Yeah. Yep, they're getting oh, bled yeah. out, and the big firms are are getting you know, bigger. Getting yeah. bigger. Consolidation. And and um, but if if you're a small farmer and your cows are worth, they were worth the eight hundred to a thousand dollars six months ago. They were. Seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars today, right. and so your neighbor, who's the big farmer, comes along and says, oh, "Are you interested in selling your farm?" Mm -hmm. Well, why would the big farmer be interested in buying that little guy? Well, because he can take the production from those little cows from that little farm and move it to the big farm to boost his production or build it up. So, you know, a small farmer, yeah, I'll sell. Well, for that kind of money, yeah, I'll sell. Well, particularly when you're, like you talked about earlier, older. You're yeah. approaching retirement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. when yeah. do I jump off? Yeah. And, yeah. And totally. it, the only thing I didn't see in here is like a focus of, how do I transfer this firm to somebody else, and where mm -hmm. where does that new person get the mm -hmm. If you're young mm -hmm. and you're looking, at, a lot of people look at these and go say, I can never afford the capital to buy yeah. three tractors yeah. of a hundred and yeah. that. no, so that's that, where that selling the yeah. development rights and things like that yeah. kick in. Well, that's for the owner. It's the older, but. If you were younger and you don't own it, yeah. you know, how do you, uh, how do they know where to go to get, you know, a section in here that says call this person right. to train, yeah. to help you. Yeah. Well, and and so we do have yeah. we do have a succession 
brief in here. I it mean, is in here. Yeah. Okay. You have and like, like I flipped no, 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 farmer and, brief, which touches on yeah, those issues too. Yeah, and and so like we point at those things as being the issues, and we did, and there's a. Um, Farmland access uh, is also part of that, and we have a capital access to capital brief in here. Good. All of those things point at that, but you're 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 absolutely touching on a really important thing. How do we knit all of those things, the pieces and the parts together, to support that young person that wants to get on a, on a new on a, get a new farm going, right? And as we mentioned before, there's not enough um, business advisors, technical providers on the ground with the knowledge of how to actually help a farm family walk through the process of doing that transfer because there's lots of different ways and so and you know it's 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 still really challenging as you know, all farm family dynamics are really challenging right so thinking about trans transferring within an existing family situation from the fourth generation to the the fifth generation for instance is one whole set of things and then if you don't have the next generation in your family and you're wanting to pass it on to somebody that's not you know biologically related to you um, that's another whole set of things uh, that has to get worked through right that is uh, potentially more money needed up front because you don't have the potential of you know mom and dad are staying in the farmhouse for as long as they're gonna live kind I'm of thing. 25 I wanna um um, raise vegetables and I want to buy 10 or 15 right. acres and I got no credit. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And you got a lot of student debt. Yep. Right. How old are you, Richie? <laughs> but there are a little I'm like, way past that. And, but I, you know, we didn't want to, like in the workforce omnibus bill the, that happened last year, for instance, I can't remember if this stuck, but at one point we were talking about could there be some kind of uh, uh, school loan um, waiving of some portion of school loans for far for for young people that wanted to get into the business of farming, that we could as a state say, okay, we're going to make this invest. We're going to make it easier for you to actually have some free cash because we're going to take care of your school debt up to some dollar amount. The two bus two program, you know, they get a free right. ride. To right. VTC. Right. But um, that's right, that's five a year. Well, I, we need to get, we, like, always, we can bump that up. And we always figured that it could be 15 to 20 right a year, but yeah. the numbers haven't really, you know, we got a high grade average. And the numbers haven't been there, and yeah. it hasn't been, I don't think that's been strongly. Promote. No, there's a definitely some work that needs to be done there, and one of the one of the recommendations that came out of that Vermont Tech Ag transformation process was to signal, you know, maybe given the changes going on in the types of agriculture, that it needs to not just be for dairy, but for diversified or livestock producers or whatever. So beefing it up to 15 to 20 a year with having some dedicated number for specifically to dairy, but then having other funds available for other types of farms could be a way to go forward? Well, I mean, we don't even have a, the state of Vermont and its educational facilities doesn't have a milking herd to teach dairy. I mean, pretty bad. Yeah, it's well, interesting. A lot of technical schools. I mean, New Hampshire has one. They got a couple of hundred farms and you know, you could, the kids want to go down there to school all the time, and New York's got them over there, and they want to go over there. I mean, you mean I like the high schools don't have it? Yeah, we don't no. have any real. Our yeah. colleges, no, our colleges don't. VTC sells their yeah. cows. UVM's got a few yeah. cows, but it's for the little pre-vet people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, our, uh, our ag program at our technical school is gone they do have maple now all right but right. they don't you know and, and you know one of the things we talked about earlier in here is the slaughterhouse stuff yeah unless you start catching some kids mm -hmm. early yeah. early yeah yeah it, you're not gonna yeah. they're it's not gonna go yeah. into the slaughterhouse when they're 30 years old yeah. you've yeah, got to get true. them when you're yeah. 16 <laughs> 17 get them interested and then well, I would really encourage you to have 
uh, Pat Moulton and Molly Willard in from Vermont Technical College. Pat Moulton now is, of course, the workforce uh, director for the Vermont State Colleges. To talk about the ag uh, transformation process, there's a new advisory board that's been established, really great group of people. You could have a couple of those folks in. Um, and, and to learn about the, the plan changes um, to create the Center for Agriculture and Food Entrepreneurship at Vermont Tech. There's been a lot of funding that's been then been raised. They're just about ready to go out to hiring or to looking for a director for the center to really rebuild that program, um, and to have a, a lot of different types of of um, hands-on learning for young people to go through that and a robust internship program. Uh, and which means that they, the kids can get out onto other people's farms to learn a lot of, uh, of what's needed to know. So that would be a good update. They're, they're, they're putting together, a, a, almost have all the money together to create a, a meat processing lab to actually, or you know, on-site facility to teach meat cutting and meat processing um, to service the job openings that exist in the, so many of the slaughter uh, and meat processing plants that need workers. So lots to, to dive into to learn more about that for sure. And you have a chance. Well, Thank uh, you so next, much. next week um, we're going to do that joint uh, yep. thing. Yeah. Um, we'll have a couple of beef farmers joining us, right? Uh, well, dairy, yeah, dairy, dairy farmers that are <laughs> um, starting to get more involved with beef, I guess you could, you could think of it as. Yep. Yeah. They are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much pasture land not being used. You know, it. You know, it's not the meadow land that doesn't get used. It's the pasture yeah. because as our dairy farms get larger, all the cows stay in the barn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the small farm that's 50 cows that put the cows out to yeah. pasture. Yeah. And that pasture land is just sitting there unused. Yeah, yeah. And, and the what what we'll talk about next week is a good actually a good example of how we're trying to address this issue of you know da large dairies that may be se selling their herds but maintaining their land, looking for other options to how to utilize that, um, and and creating an actual business model in the beef industry that can utilize that land um, at that scale because that's you know one. One way to, to address this is to utilize livestock in another industry uh, that can utilize land, um, you know, at the 400 acre, acre level. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Thank well, any so other much. questions, Irene? Someone over the weekend asked me about innovative farming, and I don't know if you have any briefs that speak to that, but you know, UVM's got to be doing some really innovative research about what farming looks like in 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. What's, what's a good way for our committee to find out more about the future of farming so that we direct our attention, not just to the things that are working today, but as the bees disappear or the avian food takes over, what, what should we be looking at? You know, is it the trellis? Like, that's even in the way, but. For down the road. Do we usually have UVM come in, some folks from the research extension. department or the, or the extension come in and talk? Uh, I don't know. We have the, traditional. Well, we've had the president in nope. before. <laughs> Um, Let's start. Uh, but the extension people, They're, we usually you usually have, have them in. Okay, because yeah. I want to make sure that um, I can answer this constituent next time we see them and say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or no, we didn't because of the freedom thing. No, yeah, that's a good um, question. Thank you. But yeah, well, I think I think uh, there's different ways that that could uh, look within a product area. I think there are certain product areas like agroforestry is an area of a lot of innovation and thinking. Um, but yeah, you could look at, like, there's a lot of innovation happening within apples, that's the way growers are growing. Um, but it's a good question, too, about, we don't have a, a brief, say, on, like, technology in the food system or how that's being implemented in, in Vermont um, at this stage. And there's probably, there is a lot of probably cool things happening around te tech and agriculture, even at a small scale. Probably Heather Darby um, and Chris Callahan from UVM Extension are probably the yeah. two that would know it the most. Yeah, Chris, yeah, Chris Callahan would be good because he's a he's an engineer by training, and so uh -huh. I think he's probably in uh, in touch with a lot of developments. Heather uh, 
she's on top of the yeah Heather on the research thing. side and yeah yeah and uh, yeah have the UVM extension director run uh, backward in uh, yeah. as, along with Chris and we and had Heather. him in well he hadn't been hired too long the last time <laughs> lots so, lots lots happening there so he's good. got. He's got a year or so yeah. under his belt, I think, now. So. Yeah, coming up on two in May. Yeah. Yes. Chris Callahan, yeah. Heather Darby, and then the, the new extension director, Roy Redford. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, thank uh, you very much. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, yeah. really, for, for giving us time. this amount of time. Really great. Yeah, you'll get your bill, though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Apparently, we didn't get the call, though, either. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, if sure. you do, if it does happen, if the evacuation happens between now and your afternoon committee, consider yourself part of this committee. Okay. And, oh. go, and go to the pink. Okay. Uh, the pink and, and don't worry about lunch. I yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you both. Thanks. Thanks. We'll see you next week.